Hello everyone, welcome to Prime Strings and this live stream with me Henriette. Lovely to see you. There were some technical issues a moment ago so if you're just joining us, joining us from another stream then uh, we'll just wait before we get started. But uh, hi Tom, good to see you in Nova Scotia and that is lovely. <laughs> you know the ropes already in this live chat. Um, because usually I ask people to um, write where they're from. Hello, Carrie Ann, and nice to see you as well. Lovely to see you here, and uh, I think you're joining us from your holiday destination. I'm hoping that you can swim on the beaches where you are, but I read otherwise in the papers. So if that is the case, I'm really sorry. And I'm hoping that it will clear up in a couple of days. So we're just holding on for a couple more minutes because there was a technical issue just a moment ago. Uh, and people might have to join us from a different stream. So um, we're just chatting a little bit before we can really get started. Oh, you've had a mixed bag of weather. <laughs> yeah. Here we have finally had some rain in East Anglia, which is badly badly needed so um hopefully we're getting some more but not at the weekend hopefully monday anyway so let's kick off and you can ask any violin related question that you may have and i will honestly try and answer it to the best of my ability um so if anyone has a question then by all means go ahead <laughs> now that often happens is always what I'm worried about that nobody asks a single question so um, uh, some of my pupils who uh, aren't here today uh, right now have asked me a question and I, th I think that is hello Enika welcome to this live stream someone has asked me a question in a lesson the other day and I know she can't make it to this class now but you will watch it on catch up so that is a very very um, well worth question that I wanted to address with you and this is about straight bowing um, okay I'm reading your questions as we go along I'll come to those but let me answer this one question about straight bowing first when we do straight bowing, we mean that we bow parallel to the bridge, don't we? <clears throat> and when you're parallel to the bridge, your, your bow should be precisely parallel to the bridge. But things change when you bow. I'm going to apologise to you uh, again for going to make a sound. And the sound quality is not the best in these live streams. So I will sound very, very screechy. So apologies for that. But when I bow, we always say we're going to point our bow arm forwards. And here you can see it happening. Can you see that? So that is our down bow straight bowing. However, if we play an up bow straight bowing and I don't do anything, look what's going to happen. That's not exactly straight, isn't it? Now, so what I need to do is to bend my wrist. Can you see what happens if on my wrist? I'm going to bend my wrist and curve my fingers even more so that my bow stays straight on the up bow. Can you see that? Take a look at the mechanics of my fingers or my bow hand. Now my bow stays parallel to the bridge. Can you see that? And what I've done is I have tried to push the bow forward in that direction so away from my shoulder if I don't do anything my bow will go over this shoulder can you see that if I allow for straight bowing take a look at my wrist when it comes into focus I'm raising my wrist slightly I was here and now I'm here I'm rolling the bow and I'm trying to point the bow in that direction can you see that so I always say to people a straight bow is actually a curved bow because i'm pushing my bow hand forwards in the down bow i'll show you again here so i'm pushing it out here but it's also going this way on the up bow can you see that 
So if I didn't do anything, I would bow like that. Can you see that? So I'm going to counteract that and I'm going to go forwards, pushing my bow arm forwards. I'm exaggerating a little bit now. And also pushing it forwards in the up bow by raising my wrist. Can you see this difference here? So my bow points that way forwards rather than going over my shoulder there. So the person for whom this is, she will know it. And I'm hoping that you will all experiment with that a little bit. Um, now, um, let's see. At what stage do we start learning the third position is Tom Bell's question. And that is a very, very good question. And I'll tell you what, something that not many people know, but there are violin methods that start playing in the third position. So you can start it any time. It's just a different approach, isn't it? So um, the idea behind this method starting in the third position is that it's probably a little bit easier because you can hold your violin here. Um, I, I've always chosen to teach starting in the first position because I think you learn to hear better because you have to do it all by your by hearing and all by yourself here without any support on the leaning against the violin there. But as soon as you start to play reasonably well in tune, there's really no reason to not play in the third position. Now, of course, when we start, when we're beginners and we're learning to play, we're starting to play in tune, there are suddenly all sorts of other things that you want to learn, namely staccato bowing, martelet bow stroke, a uh, more variety, a wider variety of pieces. And that is sometimes what's stopping us to add yet more complications to the mix by going into the third position. And I tend to wait a little bit until we've fully settled in perfect into perfect intonation and learned staccato and legato bow strokes. And you know perhaps that staccato is the name of the sound, but the bow strokes that we use to produce that sound are martelet bowing and spiccato bowing. So I want those two techniques to be out of the way, if you like, before we start playing in the third position. So I would say there are three aspects of violin playing that need to be sorted before, in my view, but that's a personal view, as I've said, <coughs> excuse me, um, that is solid intonation, being able to play legato, and staccato as well. I'm hoping that answers your question. And I'm also hoping that you realize that this is not a, a be all and end all. There are, I always say there are many different roads that lead to Rome. Um, so there isn't one right way of learning to play the violin. There are many, many different, very good methods that can go side by side really, really well. So if you prefer to learn, in the third position to start with. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's just a different choice that I have made. <clears throat> um, Carrie Ann says, I have got into a really annoying habit of hitting the strings, especially the G string. Okay, um, that happens sometimes. And there are many people that have the same issue as you just mentioned there. When you hit the G string, quite a lot it means that your bow has been tilting over to the left a little bit too much and most the most likely cause of that is that your elbow is, is a little bit too high when you play so if you find yourself more often than not hitting the g string while you don't mean to of course you don't mean to um but what you might do is try to drop this shoulder down look that brings my elbow down slightly at the same time and then if you're still hitting the G string, try to lean your elbow down a little bit as well. So I suspect that this is what's going on, that you're being a little bit tense and that your shoulder is too high. So I'm hoping in the next couple of days, try that. Whenever you hear the G string, you have already taken the first step, and that is recognizing what is going on. So once you recognize it and you hear when you hit the G string, See if that solves the issue. And it may not solve it for long because this may have become a habit of playing. But as soon as you keep thinking, oh, I hear the G string again, drop it down. 
If you do that five days in a row, then that will become uh, a way of playing and that will hopefully get better over time. Good question to ask. Um, good evening from Thailand, Mr. Muller. I did not know that you were in Thailand. Perhaps I seem to remember now. Maybe you told me this uh, during the last live stream. So welcome from Thailand. So here straight away, we have got Tom Bell, who's in Nova Scotia. Uh, Carrie Ann, who's in England. I'm in England. Enika, I can't remember where you are. Uh, Hungary or Romania, some Eastern European country. Ooh, I can't remember now. Apologies, I should know that. Um, I don't really understand staccato and legato in playing. Okay, let me let me go into this question. Enika asks, she doesn't really understand what the difference is between staccato and legato. Staccato and legato are Italian terms. And now my <laughs> Italian isn't very good, so I've learned these terms. Staccato means short, legato means smooth. So when we play, we can express different feelings, isn't it? If we, if I play this, that is legato. My notes are all smooth. If I play the same thing, all my notes are short. Um, when I teach children, I tend to say, you know, joined up writing are you old enough to do joined up writing yet and join all your letters that is legato bowing if you are writing separate letters so one letter and then a bit of blank space and then the next letter that is staccato everything is separated and the two suit different music styles and you might find some really smooth tunes or really sad songs sometimes they might use more legato and other more sort of feisty tunes might use more staccato the shorter notes make it more lively maybe i'm hoping that's helping you understand the difference between staccato and legato now staccato what i mentioned earlier the staccato is the name of the sound. So the sound that you hear is staccato. But there are different bow strokes that we can use to play staccato notes. Now it gets really complicated. So if I play staccato notes and I play my notes at the balance point of the bow, which is about here, and I play it. This is a spiccato bow stroke. The notes sound staccato because they're all separated, aren't they? Now, I could also play, and sometimes you have to play that because your bowing comes at the point of the bow. I, if I play... Also, staccato notes, all my notes are short. I play them at the upper half of the bow, and this bow stroke is called a martelet bow stroke and a martelet bow stroke makes use of the springiness of your bow you can see it i can push the stick onto the hair can't i and if i do that then i can create my martelet bow stroke so staccato is the name of the sound martelet and spiccato are two different bow strokes with which i can produce staccato notes now i'm just going to read my list i'm on the beginning of suzuki book two do you think it's wise to go off and practice other pieces of music or should i and if so which song books would you suggest definitely broaden your horizons and use different pieces that you might like to play so the question is uh carrie ann is on book two in suzuki the question is, should I pursue just this book or should I explore other music as well? And my answer is definitely explore other music because 
whenever we turn around our pieces more quickly, I mean, I can imagine if you stay on the Suzuki book, you stay on each piece for a longer period of time until you know it inside out before you then move on. The big advantage of frequently, like weekly, changes changing your pieces is that you get very good at sight reading. Sight reading is a way of reading music where you don't know the tune and you try to work it out by looking at the time signature and the key signature, maybe by listening to uh, recordings of this same piece as well. And the more you change over your pieces, you get very accomplished at learning new pieces. So it will make your learning much quicker uh, when, when you turn your music over very very quickly now there are lots of different albums that you can play from and sadly here in Norwich our music store has um, disappeared after the pandemic um, and so I can't now go and browse different albums with books but you might have a favorite composer or you might have um, uh, film tunes that you might like to play so I'd suggest you play lots of other stuff away from maybe the classical repertoire that you might like to explore. Pieces that you know are actually very, very useful for that because you already know them, so you learn them much more quickly and therefore your turnover in new pieces is increasing all the time. I'm hoping that answers your question. Uh, Annika gives you the suggestion that all for strings and ABRSM and Creekworm is very useful. All for strings is a little bit too easy, I think, for Carrie Ann because she's already a little bit too far advanced for that. But yeah, if you fancy a, a little bit of a challenge and you might like to explore the pieces in the ABRSM grade one and two books, then by all means, that, that is a good idea. You've got a nice variety of pieces because this is the way the ABRSM organizes their pieces in books. I'll just show you one. Now, these are great two pieces, just one example. And in this book, there are three different lists, list A, and that has a couple of pieces in. List B has a couple of pieces in. And list C has got a couple of pieces in. All the pieces in list, list A are Baroque pieces. All the pieces in list B are Romantic or Classical pieces. And all the pieces in list C are more modern pieces. So there is lots of variety in repertoire there. So you've got, when you buy one book here, you've got nine pieces to play from, plus a whole lot of uh, other pieces that are uh, um, propositions that you might do. So um, this is a contents page, list one has got three pieces, list B has got three pieces, list C, and there, there are a whole lot of three different lists with alternatives. So I would definitely recommend that, and you might not want to do a grade, that's absolutely fine, but they are great pieces to play and they are very well arranged for your level of playing. So that is still an answer to your question, Gary Ann. Um, oh, so I'm just reading Enika's comment. She's from Serbia, Hungarian. Okay, so my sort of uh, rough geography was all right there, wasn't it? <laughs> Oh, Carrie Ann is on holiday in England, but from Wales. But the weather is not very good, you say. Uh, oh, okay. Enika says, aha, thank you. I mixed up spiccato and staccato. Yeah, that happens a lot. And it actually, I, I have to admit, it took a while for me to work out what the difference was. But one is the difference in sound and the other one is bow stroke. Um. Okay, now let's see. Somebody else also asked me a question, and sometimes okay, I'll come to your question in a second. Um, somebody else sometimes people ask me questions in lessons, and I want to include these in this live stream as well because when people ask questions, they're usually relevant for more than this one person. 
And this person has asked me, do you know about the Dunis method? I don't even know whether you pronounce it Dunis or Downis. And um, I have to look that up because I knew about it. Well, I knew of it, I should say. The Dunis method is a well-known method, and I'm definitely going to look into it more. And Mr. Dunis was a Greek person, and he was all sorts. He was a violinist and a mandolin player and a composer, and I think also a conductor, so very, very gifted man. And he lived at the end of the 19th century. I think he was born in 1890 or 92, 93, I can't remember. And he, he was also a doctor, by the way. And he studied the big violinists of the time, such as Heifetz and Chrysler, and, and from presumably films of their playing, um, he worked out an ideal technique for especially the left hand, but also for the bow. And he is very much into the technicalities, the mechanics of left hand technique and bowing technique. And it's an interesting concept to do it like that. Um, and as I said, I, I don't know this this method but i think the the concept in itself is very interesting and that once makes me want to look into it so there is mr dunis the book that he's written the most famous book he's written is the artist's technique of violin playing so it is actually a, a scientific study and he's then translated that into violin pieces so super interesting concept i think the one thing that i always think is if you learn, if I learn to drive is my go to example. If I learn to drive, I am taught to hold my hands at 10 to 2, don't you? And but that doesn't mean when I'm an experienced driver that I always hold my hands at 10 to 2. And that is um, something that I want to explore when I look at the work of Mr. Dunis, which I will do. Um, you can't always turn the idea around if you look at the well-established, really high-class violin players and from there deduct the technique that is suitable for everyone else. It doesn't always work like that. But I'll keep you posted when I do my research whether that works or not. <clears throat> Here's another question from Enika. Uh, why is bowing in Hungarian folk songs so hard? Now, this is a very interesting question, and it, I should thoroughly recommend to you to listen to Bartok's Violin Duets. And they are amazing pieces, and I'll come to your answer in a second. Uh, duets for two violins, and Bartok was um, concerned because he was concerned that uh, he was very interesting, uh, interested in folk songs, and he was worried that if grandparents wouldn't sing the traditional folk tunes to their children and so their children to the grandchildren that this whole this whole uh, culture would go missing at some point that generations would lose the knowledge of traditional folk songs so he was going around um around farms and villages in hungary i think but I'm not sure if that's exactly what we call still Hungary. Um, and he was writing down folk songs. So he was just going around people's doors and ask old grannies to sing the songs of their youth so that he would be able to make a collection of these songs and keep them for prosperity. Now, then um, Nazi Germany came along and Mr. Bartok had to flee, fled, fled to America. And eventually he wrote these songs down with, with a newer idiom. And there, from there, um, we got the Bartok violin duet. So super interesting background. But the songs are not, well, what shall we say? They are from a different source of Western traditional music. So they have different rhythms and they have different emphases than we normally have in the music that we know and you have to realise that we as people in the Western world have got a very limited knowledge of all the music that there is. For instance, Arab music or African music, I know nothing about. So I don't understand it. So I don't recognise the patterns, 
you see. So this is why we have unlearned the rhythms of maybe the traditional folk songs. And therefore, for us, they are very, very difficult to do because we don't know them. I'm hoping that answers your question and I'm hoping it makes sense. And that is why the rhythms are so different, difficult. Tom Bell, another fantastic question. How can you keep from being overly nervous when you play in front of people? Um, many people are incredibly nervous when they play in front of other people. And uh, so it is a very, very common aspect, even among very, very experienced violin players or players of any instrument. Um, part of it is, is concern about losing your piece, losing your place, using your, losing your line. There is a serious concern, somebody has researched at some point um, among violin players of dropping the bow. <laughs> And whereas that hardly ever happens, I think in my whole career of violin lessons, I've seen two people drop their bows. Um, but the, it seems to be a very, very um, serious concern when people play in front of other people. So it is a memory issue, but it's also a, a, a concern about um, losing skills that you can do, that you can use fine in your practice room at home. And there are certain things that people can do to help. Uh, whether they are actually helping is a question. I, I'm not sure about that. First of all is to find a deeper way of learning so that you get so much confidence because you know your piece is inside out that you cannot really go wrong. That works to a certain extent because, as you and I all know, at some point unexpected things happen like you play in a performance and somebody in the front row has a loud sneeze it throws you and then you might lose it okay so external things might happen but knowing your own stuff much much better than you would normally do for any other piece that you're not performing is one thing so learning this is one of the reasons also why people play pieces off by heart because you in performances uh, because you know it that much better compared with when you play it off the music. Something else, another reason why people get very nervous is that when you perform, playing on a stage feels extremely difficult, different from playing in your own practice room. And that is because your heart rate is probably a lot higher when you're performing compared with when you're practicing at home. So what I always say to my students who do auditions for big conservatoires and so on, they get incredibly nervous. And I'll tell them to run up and down the stairs three times so that you get your heart rate up and then see what happens if then they play their audition pieces. And it falls apart really, really quickly. So one of the techniques that brings your heart rate down is to do conscious breathing. And when you can lower your heart rate before you go on stage, it's usually that just that first instance, isn't it, of getting started. Or for many people, it's tuning their violin on stage. When you play with the piano and you come onto the stage, have that quick tune up, that's the worst for most people. Um, but if you can manage to suppress your heart rate and go in there with a lower heart rate, then it, everything becomes more manageable. Because what happens if your heart rate is over the top, then your thinking goes over the top and you might well overthink a lot of things. So run up and down the stairs, then do your conscious breathing, like in through your nose. And you can all do this with me. See if you feel your pulse like this. Can I feel it? I know. Should we do that all together? All over the world, people are <laughs> checking their heart rates. I'm breathing in, a long breath in, very slow breath in through your mouth, through your nose. Hold it for a moment and then breathe out really, really slowly until you've got nothing left.
Then wait between two breaths. Then take another breath in. As a deeper breath as you've taken all day. And then breathe out really slowly. And again, breathe in. Hold your breath and then breathe out. And I can feel my heart rate having gone down considerably right now. So if I were to perform my pieces now compared with three minutes ago, I would feel a lot calmer. I'd be, my muscles would be more relaxed. My brain would be a little bit less spinning, okay? And this might help you. Um, and, and why would it help you? First of all, because your adrenaline is down a little bit, but also it helps you because if you've done this, these exercises, you have probably already also taken into account that you need to know every single detail of your piece. So you play it off by heart, you know precisely in which bar you're going to play a little bit louder or a bit quieter. And you know also how much louder or quieter you're going to go. Your position changes if you have any in your music. And uh, you know them inside out because you have practiced these position changes over and over again. And this is what my mindfulness course does and it makes you realize all these little details that are going to help you make your violin playing a lot better so if you haven't yet done that course then i would definitely recommend because it helps you to slow down and to feel more space when you play the violin which is also a great one for for um curing stage fright is not to go into yourself but to open yourself up and relax your muscles at the same time and this is very funny i'm just reading your comment now breathing is the same as i used to do at a shooting range in the military well I, forgive me i know nothing about shooting but i can totally understand that you're a little bit less shaky if you have got your heart rate down and i i imagine but like i said you can <laughs> you can tell me what it's like um uh, whether that's right or not, but I can imagine if your heart rate's down, you've got a much more steady hand. I'm hoping that answers your question. I'll tell you a funny story because uh, one of my pupils had to um, perform in a concert and she was quite, quite nervous. So I said to her, you just don't know it well enough. And you get nervous because you think it's a sort of uh, spot on, he says. <laughs> There's a lot of overlap between violin playing and the rest of the world, shall we say. <laughs> OK, thank you for that. <laughs> so um, I said to this girl, look, you know, I, I suspect that you just don't know your piece well enough. So um, I said to her, bar 45, what is it? And then she had to look, oh, I don't know what bar 45 is. And you just have to know these things. You know that whenever you stop and your first phrase and your second phrase have gone, then you're at bar nine in your third section if you play four bar phrases. You see, so it is, there is learning and then there is totally deep learning, isn't, isn't there? Oh, now that is interesting. Enika says, I try doing this exercises and it helps me to explore my injury. Yeah, I'm hope well, I'm really looking forward to learning more about the Dunis method. Of course, I've learned about this in conservatoire a hundred years ago, but um, I will definitely um, explore it because I think the concept is really interesting. Right, somebody else who is going to be um, joining this video a little bit later has said, um, I do have a question. I hope you may be able to answer. I'm still on the first few lessons. I'm struggling with playing along to the tunes with you, though. 
mainly because I'm used to counting my beats a lot faster, being a brass player. I try to play in time with you, but I just can't seem to slow me down as much, to slow down as much. I'm usually at the end of my bow in half the time as you are. My question is, is it vital to slow down or is it just as acceptable to use a metronome to mark the beats and play the pieces unaccompanied but a bit faster? Um, that is perfectly fine to play it unaccompanied and a bit faster. And um, I'm, I'm interested to hear this comment because people always say to me, um, um, people always say to me, um, I like your videos because I can play along with you and I can play it as slowly as you play it. Um, so I'm very interested to hear that you find it too slow. What happens when you are playing slowly is that you can explore each movement much more precisely. And therefore, I want to go slow because I can work out really carefully finger one and then finger two and then finger three and whatever might pop up in your music. Um, so it makes me more aware of what's going on when I slow things down. Of course, that requires more bow control. And I'm slightly concerned that when you play too fast, you can already see this, this is going up because you have slightly less control. Or you think you have more control because there is less to control when you bow faster. So give it a go a few times, if I may uh, give you a suggestion, uh, and see if you can get your shoulders down and to relax into the movements. And you'll find that one day you can play much more slowly. And, and you might start just by playing very long open strings so that you get a complete overview of what happens to your right shoulder. Because I fear that when you go too fast that your shoulder comes up. And the same with the left hand as well. Of course, I can play fast if I tense everything. And in the short term, that is going to sort out a lot of issues. But... If I want to go really fast, then I can't go faster than fast, you see. Then I need that relaxation. And I'm hoping that I'm answering your question in the way you meant your question. Uh, but maybe another time we can meet up in this class and, and discuss it further. Here's another question from carrie -Anne. What do I do when my fine tuners won't turn anymore? That's a very common thing to happen as well. Fine tuners, I don't know if you know how they work. Let me see if I've got a fine tuner so I can show you. Sorry, I'm just going to get one. Oh. Sorry, I can't read it right now. Um. Fine tuners work by pushing down a lever which tightens the string and there's a little screw that pushes down the lever um, and if it's down in it into its lowest section it can't move because this is pushing down and it and it brings the lever back at some point you can't go further down or what you sometimes see is that people are drilling a hole in the belly of their violin and um, so sometimes it won't go any further and then you need to loosen it completely and tighten your string at the peg end. Okay, so if you're trying it here and you're right down, you need to undo this and then tighten it a little bit more on your on your peg. And then you have got a, a new bit of leeway to sort out your fine tuner. So that sometimes happens, yes. Um, and I normally get my daughter to tune my violin, but now she says I have to do it myself. <laughs> I love your daughter. Uh, for those of you who can't read the comments, Carrie Ann says, I normally get my daughter to tune my violin, but now she says I have to do it myself and stand on my own two feet. <laughs> Oh, that's a very fun, funny comment. That makes me laugh out loud. So this is how you can do it. You can say to your daughter, you go and do your own things. I can do this. <laughs> I'm hoping that that has solved your problem. 
Um, I've got another question. Why is it mainly on the E string that my straight bowing goes all over the place and not on the other strings? Would it help if my violin wasn't as tilted? Now, that is that is one thing. I'll come to your question, Enika, in a second. Um, the question is, why is it, especially on the E string, that my bowing straight bone goes all over the place is it that my violin is tilted i wouldn't think that that would have anything to do with it i think it is the angle of your arm look it's easier to bow straight when you can see it it's right right in front of my face when i'm playing on the g string whereas on the e string i can't really follow especially if i'm reading my music here i can't really see my hand you see so that way you might come away from your music, play on the E string and, and watch your arm go forward and go back up and make that nice tilt that we spoke about earlier and, um, and then start to feel it. Do it so many times that you start to feel where your straight bowing is. But I don't think it has got much to do with the tilting because, well, maybe it does. Come to think of it, you can see it a bit more if it's a bit flatter, isn't it? So uh, let's have a word about that at, at your next lesson, and then we we can explore whether that has something to do with it. I wouldn't have thought, but who knows? I don't know the, the answer to every single question, as I said to you before. Um, let me just read. Is there a system to make it sliding? You show us with pegs and graffiti. Um, yes, you can make it easier, but those are not your fine tuners. Your fine tuners, I think Karyan means the fine tuners here, the adjusters. Uh, here, I wouldn't do anything to it. Now, if you have difficulty using the big pegs uh, here and there, you can do something to it. Now, there is a special peg paste that you can get. Now, this I've got nearby so I can show you. And this is a sort of brown stuff. It's also sometimes called hill earth. It's sort of like a lipstick that you can turn up. And this is, I, I'll call it peg preparation. And you can put it on the peg. I haven't got a violin with, with no strings on, sadly. Uh, when you take your string off the violin and you've got the peg, you put this stuff on the peg and it is magical stuff because it both makes the peg more slippy if they are slippery, uh, more sticky if they're slippery, and they make them more uh, movable when they're stiff. What it actually does, this stuff, it's a sort of waxy stuff, um, but if you have a peg hole and you have the peg taken out quite a lot of the time you can see that there's no varnish inside the peg hole and the peg hole wears off a little bit when whenever you turn the peg and when you put peg preparation on your peg and you wriggle it into the peg hole then you fill up any unevennesses on the inside of the peg hole which makes it move better so that is what peg preparation does and Another thing that you can do to help your strings move a bit better is just with when your string is off, put some pencil, just rub some pencil lead in the groove here. So that and that is graffiti, uh, uh, gra um, graphite. Sorry, I, I say it wrong. That is graphite, and that helps this slip a little bit more just here in the grooves in the nut. It's like you you put graphite in your in the lock of your front door, for instance, isn't it? It makes your key move more smoothly. I'm hoping that answers your question, Enika. Is there anyone else who's got a question? <laughs> that did make me laugh. Um, somebody else has asked me a question as well, and the question is, is there such a thing as a bad bow, and can you have bad bow hair? 
Um, yes, there is something as a bad bow and bad bow hair. Bow hair um, is made from horse hair or from nylon, which represents horse hair. Uh, but I don't know if you have ever been to a hairdresser shop where they had like a, a hair under a microscope, like a little hair picture. So you've got the hair and then there are all these little side strands of the hair. And, and the same is the case. So this is a, a horse hair under the microscope, yes. The same thing happens with your bow hair. And if you if you bow quite a lot with your bow, then these little wispy bits here wear off. So your bow becomes more slippery and it holds the rosin in your bow much less. And that means that your bow hair is worn out and you need to have it replaced. And most for most people, that takes about a year to a year and a half. Of course, it depends on how often you play. Um, and so there is bad bow hair when it's worn out. And you notice that bow hair gets worn out if you feel that you need to rosin your bow every five minutes. If you can't get the grip on the string with your bow, and that means you might have to have your bow hair replaced. Now, that's a fairly straightforward job for any violin maker. So um, the bow hair is expensive. Here in the UK, it costs about £75 or so to have your bow rehaired. But you'll feel the difference. And, and you can make a much warmer, much better sound again when you've got new hair that has those wispy bits on it. And it will give your bow much more traction on the on the string. Now, I recently had a pupil in America who felt that her bow, she'd bought a cheap bow somewhere and the bow was very, very bendy like that. Now, every bow has a little bit of movement. I, I don't know how I can best show you. Can you see that? And the bow was just flailing all over when she was bowing. And she recently got a new bow and she said, how have I been able to play on that bow, which was really, really too soft and too bendy to track properly on the string. So, uh, yes, there can be bad bows as well as bad bow hair. Let me just have a look at this um, text box again. For fine tuners, and there's something which makes them sliding is... My fine tuners are moving so hard. Okay, can I take on them oil? Um, are they just not moving, Enika? Uh, because it may be that it's gone right down and it's it's stuck because this, this is just a screw, basically, um, that the screw is. Or is it stuck because there is some grit in between it? In which case, yeah, you might try... Take it off your violin first and put some graphite on it and maybe it works better. Uh, are the tuners stuck? Can you loosen them? Yes. So, yeah, those are a couple of questions that you might explore. Take the tuner, fine tuner off and see why it's not working. I mean, the same happens to a bow sometimes as well. Now, this is not something you can try at home, but I'll show you. Uh, here's another screw. It's similar, similar um, principle. So like I say, don't try this at home. This is a big screw. Can you see that? And that sometimes gets a bit gritty. And don't ask me why, because it sits inside the bow. And this screws the heel of the bow backwards. So there's a little, a little eye through which that screw moves. And that moves it forward and backwards the more I tighten it. Now, this screw sometimes gets a little bit gritty, as I said, and then you put some graphite on it and it will move better. So I suspect that if you can't move your tuners because not because they are down at the lowest point, but it just won't move that there may be a little bit of dirt or so into the screw, in which case take it apart, take the screw out, turn it up all the way until it comes out and then put a bit of graphite in, put it back in, see if it works better. And if that doesn't work, I don't know. That depends on, look, if you've got, I've got a separate tailpiece, so I could put fine tuners on here if I wanted to. 
but most people will have an, what's called an integrated tailpiece. So that is this thing is called the tailpiece and it's got the fine tuners built in. So if one has got completely stuck and it doesn't work anymore, or sometimes what I see in pupils' violins, they lose the screw. <laughs> Worst case, it falls into the violin. But sometimes when they lose the screw, you need to replace the whole tailpiece and buy an integrated one from the brand Wittner. You can buy it on Amazon or at the Wittner shop. Um, they are very, very good brand. And buy some good integrate a good integrated tailpiece. So I'm hoping that answers your question. Is there anyone else who wants to ask another question? I take graphite on pegs on kind how you show it with pencil and then they work. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Very good. Now let's see. <laughs> Somebody's asked you another question here. Um, why do you like the violin of all the different instruments that you can choose from? Now that question, I want to fire back at you. Why did you choose choose the violin out of all the instruments that you can choose from? And when I get a few answers, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> Why was it the violin? Why not the cello? Why not the flute? What made you play the violin? Who's going to answer that question first? Or did you just always know it was the violin? That would be interesting, wouldn't it? COVID! <laughs> COVID! But why not the violin? Why the violin? Why not another instrument? Did you have a violin at home? Why didn't you play percussion when it was COVID and you had to um, do so learn something new, a new skill? Go on, you people. What made you play the violin and not another instrument? Ah, because I can play online for children. Yeah, good answer. That's nice, isn't it? That's what I do as well, play online for children and adults. And they're interested in it. Who else is there? What made you play the violin? I think I've actually answered this question already last class. Nobody, nobody comes forward. Uh, um, so what made me play the violin? You know, as a child, we had a violin in our loft. And one day I asked my mum uh, and in the garden. Okay. And uh, one day I asked my mum to get the violin down because it was an instrument that... <laughs> you make me laugh. You make me laugh. Uh, I ask myself the same question, why is it the violin and not anything else? It's easier to carry around than a piano. <laughs> God chose me and my father. Okay, um, so we have this violin in our house that my mum used to play and my granddad also used to play. And I, I thought it was just cool to cycle because I grew up in Holland, so we did a lot of cycling to violin lessons. And I thought it was the coolest thing to put a a violin on your back and and go to a lesson. I thought that was the reason why I <laughs> learned to play the violin. I started because I had a violin knocking about in the attic. Yeah, similar thing, isn't it? And then I started to challenge and learn new things. The Rebel Book Challenge. I've never heard about the Rebel Book Challenge. Um, uh, but haven't we all taken to some sort of new challenge over COVID. Like Enika said, COVID is why I started to play the violin. And you do the Rebel Book Challenge. I go, I'm making a note of that. Uh, and that is when you learn something new. But isn't it refreshing to learn something new? And I think I've told you in the past as well, I've been learning Chinese for three years. Not that I can speak a word of Chinese, but it's just really nice to learn something new. It keeps your brain engaged, and it's not about the results. It's just about the process of learning new things and just exploring something different. And this is why I applaud all of you, is that you take the plunge and that you... 
go out and learn a new skill. It's it's very good for all kinds of things in life, isn't it? And for my teaching in particular, I think learning a skill which I'm awfully bad at, namely Chinese, makes me understand how learning a new skill for you guys must be. So people say, are you are you very um, patient? Yes, because I, I totally understand how difficult it is to learn a new skill and to stick with it and how difficult it is not to get distracted. So thank you for all your um, open-hearted um, comments about how you learned to, how you came to play the violin. Now, final question. Anyone in this group We'll have a final question with four minutes to go. And if you haven't got one, there's one more remaining in my list of questions that people have submitted. It's like Girl Guides for Adults. Absolutely it is. Yeah. Oh, this is your book. It's your um, the Rebel Challenge book, maybe. I think that's what you mean. So... The final question that somebody has asked is, are all rosins good and can you have too much rosin on your bow? And yes, you can have too much rosin on your bow. Did you know that? It doesn't happen too often. Most people that come to my practice have far too little rosin on their bows. But if you find that you're playing the violin and you have got a big layer of rosin dust around here, then yes, I suggest that you rosin a lot less. So yes, you can have too much rosin on your violin. Um, it's about right when you've got a little bit of rosin on your strings, but that it doesn't fall too much onto the varnish because rosin has a chemical reaction with the varnish and it eats, eats away the varnish. So that's why you should always clean the rosin off your, off your varnish so that you protect your varnish. Um, are all rosins good? Well, they're all very different, aren't they? Um, I photographed three different rosins <laughs> the other day. Uh, there's light rosin, there's dark rosin, there's hyper and allergenic rosins for people who sneeze a lot when they put rosin on their bows or play on ordinary rosin. And there is softer rosin and harder rosin, and the softer rosin is more suited to warmer climates, so people... Maybe like you in Thailand, um, um, who was it? Someone here. Um, it's not Mr. Paul Miller. Maybe you in Thailand use different rosin from us here in Northern Europe, um, where we tend to use slightly harder rosins, the darker rosins. Okay. Somebody is already saying thank you again for an informative session. See you next month. Next month will be sort of late in the month. Let me discuss with you a time um, so that most of you can make it. Let me see. And then I, I was thinking I'll have one towards the end of September. 23rd of September. How's that for everyone? 23rd of September. Okay. Great. Can most people make that time? Okay, 23rd of September it is then. And then we'll have one very late in October. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being a very valued member of Henriette's Violin, Violin Club. It's really lovely to have the club and have so many members in it. So uh, thank you so much. Please spread the word. And I will see you definitely on the 23rd of September, if not before, in a comment section of the video sometime. I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Bye.